Bluegrass Airport is an American aviation story. Its remarkable history has been chronicled through a series of oral history interviews. We are speaking with Frank Peters, who is a volunteer with the Aviation Museum of Kentucky and serves on the board of directors and executive committee of that organization. Frank, what is your connection with Bluegrass Airport? Uh, my connection with Bluegrass Airport is pr principally through the uh, Aviation Museum of Kentucky, where I am a, um, on the board of directors and the executive committee, but also a docent. So I'm one of those people that will take people on tours. Are you a pilot yourself? No, I'm not. I'm one of the few people at the museum who is not a pilot. How did you become interested in aviation? Well, I think it probably started when I was very young. I suspect uh, four or five years old. We lived in a rural area in western New York, and uh, occasionally I would see an airplane fly over, and I absolutely wanted to be in one of those airplanes. I thought that was really cool. So that was my very first initiation to an airplane. And that's, I think, how I first became interested. What brought you to central Kentucky? Uh, when when uh, I retired from the uh, energy department in Washington, uh, my wife and I were uh, looking for a place where we could um, retire with um, a quality of life that was somewhat different than what we had experienced in Washington. Um, a university-based uh, town, somewhat smaller than Washington, uh, nice people and all that kind of thing, and we sure found it here. How long have you lived here? We came in 2003. So, as a newcomer to the Aviation Museum of Kentucky, did you know what to expect? I did not know what to expect. I had been to a number of aviation museums elsewhere in the country, um, and I just, because I knew that, I found out that there was one here and decided that it would be a neat thing to just go over and take a look at it. Uh, I was quite impressed uh, when I first went in as a, as a tourist, so to speak, and it took me a while, uh, a couple of months, to, to think through whether I wanted to become a volunteer, and I did, and they were very welcoming to me. And um, since that time, we've gone through a fair amount of change, and uh, I believe we have a very, very good museum that's getting better all the time. And I think that the primary reason that it is um, something important to me and I think to the community is because it provides an opportunity for both kids and adults to have some, in some way, uh, be able to realize um, or move on the path of realizing uh, their dream of flight from the very early days of, their, of their, uh, their time. Did you write something for the museum? I'm not a professional writer, but Bob Cole, uh, who is uh, a man who I have for, with whom, for whom I have great, great esteem, um, asked me at one point to put together a, uh, a history of the Bluegrass Airport, or at least aviation in the Bluegrass area. And he had in mind uh, putting together an exhibit for the museum, so I was happy to help Bob with that. And the answer is yes, I did uh, write a piece on that. And received a huge amount of help from uh, Amy and Eric here at the airport in turning that piece of paper into a, what I consider to be a very, very nice exhibit that is a, sort of a, a nice tribute to Bob Cole. Talk about the children that come to the museum. Well, certainly. Uh, we not only, of course, have children coming in with their parents or other members of their family, but also um, children come in in groups, uh, typically from local schools. Uh, either private schools or public schools. And we find, at least I find personally, and I think many of the other docents at the museum find that um, it's a really wonderful opportunity to share our love of aviation, our love of airplanes, with these kids who might otherwise never have an opportunity to get close to an airplane, except possibly as a passenger. But when kids walk through that door, and they see an airplane in front of them inside a building, it's, it's the wow factor, it's terrific. It really is terrific. It makes you feel good. And we're, we do our best to um, try and inspire them to think about how aviation fits into their lives and how it might fit into their future lives. And um, in addition to that, the programs, uh, the museum has programs including summer camps and uh, other programs where there have been graduates who have gone on to 
become astronauts in training or people working in the aviation industry as engineers and that kind of thing. So I think the uh, many folks at the museum believe that they are instrumental in helping promote that kind of love of aviation with the kids that come to visit with us. Frank, what is your favorite period of aviation? Well, I would say 1950s and early 1960s commercial aviation, passenger aviation. Um, and I don't have any particular reason for that except when I kind of list the, my favorite airplanes, they all seem to fit into that category into that time frame. Do you have any favorite aviation stories or idols? Well, I can give you probably a long and a short answer to that one. My, long, my, my short answer would be um, people that I would like to have met that I idolize, uh, Charles Lindbergh, first, man to fl or first person to fly across the Atlantic uh, solo, um, Eddie Rickenbacker, uh, World War I hero and uh, chairman of Eastern Airlines. And the reason the Rickenbacker is special to me especially is because when I was probably eight or nine years old, maybe 10 years old, my father was a uh, chief nursing supervisor at a large mental hospital in the town that, uh, that I grew up in. And one of the patients that my dad was caring for learned that I was uh, interested in airplanes, interested in aviation. So somehow this patient got in touch with Mr. Rickenbacker's staff and arranged for a, an autographed picture that was then sent to me by, by Eastern Airlines. And I still cherish that, I still have it at home. I think that was really cool. In terms of um, other people, other, let me call them heroes, many of the people at the museum, um, people like John Bales, like Dick Wood, people who have served this country as naval aviators on aircraft carriers or uh, with the Air Force, a gentleman named Tim Smith, who's now a captain with Southwest Airlines, uh, who flew bombers for the United States Air Force. Um, huge, huge service to the country. Um, my cousin Gary, who not only flew with the Navy, but also was the uh, chief pilot for Delta. I mean, these are all people that are important to me and in some respect heroes because I hugely respect their contributions to aviation and, and what they have done. I have a nephew who is, um, as we speak, flying a C-17 in Afghanistan and Iraq, and I have huge respect for that as well. Tell us what you know about Holly Field and Cool Meadow. I must admit that I don't have a, uh, I have not reviewed that piece for a while, but what I do recall um, about Holly Field is that basically it was a, uh, a field on a farm it was probably Lexington's first um, official airport, so to speak, or sort of unofficial airport, but that's where people flew in and flew out from. There was one situation, as I recall, where a pilot named Jesse Creech, who flew with Rickenbacker in World War I, uh, who had a plane called the Daniel Boone that was located, or the first privately owned airplane in Lexington, I believe, where he came in um, one day and landed and opened up the door and took out a pig. And the pig was apparently part of a gag, so to speak, or some bet that had been made between the mayor of Lexington and the mayor of Chicago. And apparently the mayor of Lexington won and got a pig out of the process. So Mr. Creech brought it down and landed at Halley Field and took out the pig. I thought that was pretty cool. Um, I don't have really any uh, specific recollections of the other airport. It was called Meadowthorpe and uh, Cool Meadow also, um, except that there used to be a parachute company here in Lexington. And I re as I recall from my research, the parachute company frequently used Cool Meadow as a test bed for their parachutes, tying the parachutes to uh, dummies and throwing the dummies out of the airplane. and seeing how they worked, how the parachutes worked. That's, those are my recollections about those two airports. Frank, can you tell us about your first flight? I uh, don't think so. I was um, about nine years old. I could tell you the flight number, flight 780, American Airlines. Uh, my dad had, prior to that, uh, taken me to a small local airport in western New York for a uh, my first, very first flight, and um, that was in an air coupe, 
And I was so thrilled with that that he uh, took the opportunity to fly the family down to see some relatives in uh, the New York City area. And um, he booked American Flight 780 uh, because it landed and took off a lot. In other words, he could have gotten a nonstop flight, but he thought that I would really enjoy taking off and landing. And we did. We landed in from Buffalo to uh, Rochester to Syracuse and on down to LaGuardia. And it turns out that that route, uh, part of that route, was actually um, one of the original airmail routes from the 1920s that the uh, government chartered that had gone from Albany, New York to uh, Cleveland, Ohio. So I had a little bit of history associated with that flight as well. Tell us some of the things you find interesting about Bluegrass Airport. Well, I think the, in terms of bluegrass field, I was um, interested to learn when I did my research that it had been essentially taken over by the government uh, during World War II as a training base and, and for, for other purposes. Um, and also interested to learn that uh, Eddie Rickenbacker was here to dedicate bluegrass field uh, in 1946 after it was essentially turned back over to the city. I thought that was cool. And my friend Bob Cole, who you spoke with previously, um, shared with me that when both Eastern Airlines and Delta Airlines uh, decided that they were going to have scheduled service out of Lexington, my understanding is there was sort of a race on who was going to first land the DC-3 here. And uh, Eastern was scheduled to be first, but something happened, so Delta beat him in. And Bob, I think, may have been employed by Eastern at that time, so might have been a bit disappointed. But uh, he got over it, so that was no problem. 